Well, good morning and welcome again to our live stream. If you're just turning in and to our guests and the, the members of Southside Bible Church, we're going to continue worshiping now through the preached word of God. So if you'll turn with me to Romans chapter two, where we're going to take back up in our study, we're currently studying through the book of Romans. The first Sunday of every month, we celebrate communion uh, together as a church. And though we can't be in the same building, again, we are in heart and we're going to partake together this morning and remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our Lord for us. So if you could have the elements ready in your house uh, for the close of the service, we will have communion uh, at the end. So by way of introduction, I wanted to show it to you kind of a, there, there, this word that has been jumping out at me all week as I just keep studying and praying and wrestling and checking uh, this section. Chapter two is a, a tough uh, section of scripture. And it's this word um, revealed, revealed, revelation. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God to bring people into the realm of salvation for in it, the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed. It's, it's made manifest at present tense as, as it's being proclaimed. There's a, a righteousness that you can have that God gives to bring you into salvation. It's been revealed. And then Paul moves into the bad news. He says that God's wrath is also being revealed present tense because there's a general revelation, a, a, a revealing of who God is by his creation. And that's been rejected. It's been suppressed by unrighteousness. And then in chapter two, God's special revelation. And this morning, he'll even talk about the moral code that's written within humanity, that this moral code and God's special revelation has been revealed in the law of Moses and in creation of the human code. And it's been rejected in the same way by unrighteousness same kind of rejection. One approves, one disapproves, but they both reject the manifestation of God by unrighteousness. And the way these people do it is they, they shine the law on other people. They teach other people. They, they look at their privilege as, as religious people, but they don't do it. He keeps saying again and again, they, they don't do it. They don't keep it. And what's coming then for them is an eschatological wrath at the end of history, this judgment day that Paul is talking about. So how should they have used the law? Flip over to Romans 3 verse 19 as he closes out the section we're in. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God because by the works of the law, no flesh will ever be justified in his sight. For through the law just comes the knowledge of God. And so the law is a floodlight upon your heart that's showing you that you, you've never kept the law truly ever. And it was to show you your sinfulness that it would lead you to the only remedy that you could find for your unrighteousness. Then in Romans 2, 5, Paul says there's going to be the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Something else is going to be revealed. There's a last day judgment coming. And in verse six, he's going to render to all men according to their deeds. And as we journey that, I told you I would try to flush that out more this morning. But I'll tell you this, we, we don't merit life, but we live as those who have received it. That is not a new message. We've been looking at this since we started Southside to show that this gospel of justification by faith in Christ alone changes you. And God's spirit's put within you and the law is written and you're going to begin to, to live different than when you were in Adam. And so there's going to be a revelation of a righteous judgment at the end time before a king. And then in uh, Romans 2.16 this morning, we'll take up on the, the day, this judgment day, when according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ. There's going to be another revelation that's going to take place. And we're going to stand before this God and there's going to be a revelation of your heart and your motives and your intents and your heart sins that you thought were hidden and in the dark. He says there's going to be another revelation that's going to be made on that day. And all of this is to lead you to Romans 3, 
And I want to read something special in verse 21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been what? Revealed. It's been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. There's another revelation. Here it is. It's, it's encompassed in 117 and 321 and 22 that there's another, there's a righteousness that actually can make you acceptable to God. And all this trying by, by, by uh, law and working at it and trying to keep it, all of that is just showing you you're unrighteous. You can't get there. You can't climb the ladder. And then there's this unrighteousness and there's a righteousness for those people now who will come to Christ in faith and look to him alone for the righteousness that you will need to be saved from the wrath of God on this eschatological judgment day that is coming for all. So the gospel is for the, the, we're all unrighteous and we're guilty and we're under the condemnation of God and his wrath. And there's the offer to us of a righteousness, not our own, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's not by works, but by faith that will look away from anything in yourself and look only to Christ. That's why I'm not ashamed of this gospel. It is the power of God to bring us into the realm of salvation. And so my prayer this morning is that God would reveal to you your utter and absolute need of his son and his salvation. And the Holy Spirit will convict of sin and judgment, and the righteousness that we need to get through the fires of wrath and stand boldly and blameless in the presence of God. So let's go before him and and ask that he would do that in every home, in every place that this is being watched, and with the sweet saints here from the AVL and worship team. Father, I thank you. I love this gospel. It is your power. God, it is the the power of God to take us out from under your wrath and bring us into favor and love and acceptance and adoption. God, would you have your way with every one of us? I want everyone listening this morning to have this. God, please move in power and do what only you can do. Let us get the truth of this passage. There, There are tricky parts. God, and we need your spirit to lead us and navigate us through it. And I look to you for help and you alone from your word and your spirit for one goal, your glory, and your glory alone as a saving God. Amen. Well, the outline we began looking at last week was that in Romans 2, we looked at 5 through 11, but really we're going to look at 2, 5 through 16 And last week was three truths to understand God's judgment rightly. And we're just going to keep that outline. And it's really four truths that we need to understand God's judgment rightly. So last week we began in verse six, there's a certainty of judgment guaranteed. God has said all of humanity is going to come on this last day and there will be a judgment. And secondly, the comprehensiveness of judgment, each one, everyone will stand before God On judgment day, single file, one by one, we will all have a judgment day. Thirdly, the criterion of judgment that Paul lays out is is deeds in verse 6, who will render to each person according uh, to their deeds. And so not what you said, he's saying, but what you did. And so I want to make sure that we don't lose justification by faith in Christ alone. That'll be the only way you'll ever be right with God. But as, as the Bible says, from cover to cover, this will change you. And, and what we're going to do when we stand before God is there's going to be a, a manifestation that this grace has acted upon me. And so these deeds are never going to be what saves me. Never. <laughs> it will always be the finished work of Jesus Christ. But that finished work isn't finished. It's working in each one of us. And it's changing and it's transforming and it will bring us to glory. And so I want you to, it's a, it's a tricky concept, but the scriptures proclaim it, the criterion for judgment. And now this morning, we're going to look at the fourth part, 
the judgment of God is impartial. And so Paul would do this a lot. He knew every objection that would be thrown at him because he was always sowing this gospel and preaching and debating wherever he went. So he very, very rarely leaves a stone unturned. And I love it. Thank you, God, for Paul. So what is it? Well, Paul, you're talking like the Jews and Gentiles are going to be judged alike. And the Jews, we, we have Abraham. We have circumcision. We have the law of Moses. We're your chosen people. We're not like the Gentile dogs. You're just kind of flatlining us here. We're, we're the chosen ones. Paul's going to answer that. I want you to look at the argument beginning in verse 11. For there is no partiality with God. That Greek word means the respect of face. It means the, the appearance. <laughs> so the, there's no just judging you according to appearance. Your, your position, the place that you occupy, your status, a, a bishop, a deacon, an elder, pastor. I'm a Baptist. I'm a Presbyterian. I'm the church secretary. Sorry, Jana. <laughs> Heritage of Christians. It's all going to be irrelevant, all the externals. God's not taken in by those. And verse 11 starts with four. Continuing the argument. There's going to be a judgment according to deeds and works, the ground level. But Paul is moving to lead you to this place called justification by faith in Christ alone, the pillar in which we stand. Paul's leading and driving. He's tutoring you to that. And from that pillar will flow good deeds that surpass the righteousness of scribes and Pharisees that now come from love to God and love to others. A way better righteousness, a, a works that were prepared before the foundation of the world that we should walk in them. God's prepared them. He's predetermined them for us to walk in them. The obedience of faith that Paul's laboring for in the book of Romans. And so we looked at this chiastic structure in verses 7 through 10. And I want you to catch something now as we move into verse 11 that I didn't park on last week. <laughs> Look with me in verse 9. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But the glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So he keeps saying both. For there's no partiality with God. And so the priority here is if you'll remember back in Romans 1 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. So there's a historical priority to redemptive history for the Jews. The Jew has had priority of gospel blessings. But now Paul's saying with that comes a priority in divine judgment. Your priority in blessings is actually not escaping you from judgment. It's giving you actually a priority in divine judgment. The promise of the gospel went to the Jew first. <clears throat> so this does not exempt you then from judgment. But it makes you first in line for judgment. Religious people need to hear that. It doesn't exempt you. It actually puts you in the front lines. The fact that you are religious have a Bible, attend church, and condemn the sin in others. The fact that you've won Oscars or Emmys or Pulitzers or the man of the year, the reputation and your titles, your culture and your ceremonies, whether you're rich or poor, Bible training, child stories or not, circumcision or uncircumcision, Paul's going to say every single one of you will be judged by your deeds. Not what you say or approve or disapprove. Not that you nod to creeds or you agree with a doctrinal statement. But did the justification by faith in Christ alone transform and change a life? The partiality extends then to verse 12. If you'll look with me, another four. For there's no partiality with God, and he'll continue to explain this, four all have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. 
And so in 6 through 10, what we looked at last week was this judgment according to deeds. And then in verse 11, there's no partiality with God. And then in verses 12 through 16 now, and so 6 through 10 is there's a judgment according to works. And 12 through 16 is there's a judgment according to light, a judgment according to the truth that you've received. And so get this, the Jews have some advantage that the Gentiles don't. In, in this book, in chapter 3, he will hit them. And in Romans 9, 4, he says, we're, we're Israelites, to who belongs the adoption of sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises, whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. So the Jews argue and say, you bet God's partial to us. We're his chosen people. The Gentiles are saying, wait a minute, how can you say God is impartial? We didn't have the benefits of the law. We didn't have God's special revelation that the Jews had. And so here's the argument from both sides. And I think this is dealing with Jews and Gentiles, just religious, moral hypocrites. What an answer. God will render to everyone according to privilege. What we have received in the way of revelation will actually be weighed in judgment. God will take into account the response that we make to the measure of revelation that we receive on believers. So this is hard. The more you know, and the more revelation, the more that you're accountable for. And and that is sober for churchgoers who are not redeemed. Because you know the fullness of his revelation and the fulfillment of the Old Testament and the person and work of Christ and and you know his will in the New Testament. And this generation that we live in has had the most revelation because we've lived after the ascension of Christ, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the giving of the scriptures, and we've had all of history in the study of different doctrines. And so to sit under the teaching and the preaching of God's word and not respond in faith and repentance will only heighten the judgment. It's going to be considered. So I've had people say, well, pastor, then I'm just going to stay ignorant. (laughs) I'm going to quit listening to you like half my church. (laughs) I don't know if you're sleeping. It's been really hard on me. Wake up. If you're sleeping, I miss seeing some of you just kind of dozing during my sermons. I I didn't know I would ever miss that, but I do. So you, you can just put away the Bible, turn it all off, turn off the radio, forget this. And and what I say is hell is hell. There's no place in it that anybody wants to be. It is only through the truth of the gospel alone that you can be delivered from it. Today is the day of salvation. And if you've grown up in the church, Christian home, with all this privilege, my message to you this morning is don't die in privilege, but die in Jesus Christ. That's what Romans 2 is after. Do not die in your privilege, but in Christ alone. The Jews later are arguing privilege And Paul does another boomerang. And he says, your privilege, without getting of of what it was all pointing to, is only going to heighten your judgment on that last day. Okay. Verse 12. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. And so we got two classes. We got the unlawed. They got no special revelation. They don't have the Mosaic law and the prophets. They don't have that. And then you got those who are in law and and they have the Mosaic law and they're sinning against it daily. And Paul says, you're both outlaws. Both of you are going to be judged, Jew and Gentile. Gentiles are are lawless. (laughs) And this this word here, it means unprivileged. They, They don't have the law. They they didn't get it. They didn't get what the Jews had. And and sinning, he says, they will perish. And that word was condemnation. 
They, they will not be condemned by the law. They will not perish on account of what they never had, but on what they did have. And what they did have was revelation. And then listen to verse 32 of chapter one. Although they know the ordinances of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but they give hearty approval. Paul says they know. They know the ordinances of God and that if we practice these, we're going to be judged. The, the Gentiles have that common thing written upon them. <clears throat> and then uh, Romans 2.14 is what we're going to look at. There's more. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law, Mosaic law, are law to themselves. And that they show the work of the law written in their hearts their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. And so just get this point. We're going to flush it out. The law or not, whether you have it, if you sin, you will be judged. If special revelation, you will be judged by it because you have transgressed. Both orders, the, the moral law in your own heart or the revelation of God's law that was given to you. The same thing as unrighteousness is going to bring the, the judgment of God. And so the Gentile says, I have no law. How could I be judged? And the Jew says, I have the law. So there's partiality with us. We're the sons of Israel and they're both arguing. And I just, I want you to get this principle. And I'm just going to read a couple of verses from the gospels and, and listen first to Matthew eleven twenty. <clears throat> I don't have coronavirus. You all know me well. It's allergies. He began, Jesus began to reproach the cities in which most of his miracles were done. They saw the power of God and they heard the preaching of the kingdom and they didn't repent. His kindness didn't lead them to repentance. So he says, woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles had occurred and occur, occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented a long time ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, it's going to be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You shall descend to Hades. For if the miracles had occurred, occurred, I'm having a hard time with that word, in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would, they would still be here to this day. <laughs> Sodom and Gomorrah and all their sin. This is abomination and the homosexuality and, and all that was happening in that city. Nevertheless, I say to you that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. And here's that principle again, is the one with more light rejected is going to have greater judgment. And Christ said it very clearly in Luke 12, 41. I want you to hear this. Peter said, Lord, are you addressing this parable to us or to everyone else as well? It's a fair question. And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and sensible steward whom his master will put in charge of his servants to give them their rations at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he returns. Truly I say to you, that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that slave says in his heart, my master will be a long time in coming and begins to beat the slaves, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that slave will come on a day when he doesn't expect him, second coming, and at an hour he does not know. And he will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will shall receive many lashes. But the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. And from everyone who has been given much shall much be required and to whom they entrusted much of him they will ask all the more. And so there's this more revelation that's rejected. There'll be greater punishment than the one who had less revelation. And so there, there's this degree of light that will come into judgment. There'll be no partiality with God. You will be judged according to the light that you had. And you disobeyed it. 
You were unrighteous to the revelation that you had. And God says you'll be condemned. Look at me in verse 13. For it's not the hearers then of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. These religious hypocrites, they will not do what God's word says. And they will not let his kindness lead them to repentance and believe and come to Christ and love the fulfillment of the law. They hear it, they know it, they teach it, they recite it, but they don't do it. And the goal of this gospel, the glory of God is the obedience of faith for his glory. That faith comes out of this justification, the life that will come out of this gospel. There's only one way to get that kind of obedience. And that's where this whole epistle is moving. And I'm going to share that again with you at the end of the sermon, because it's easy to get off on these waters. They're tricky. We're on a razor's edge. So friends, this is not how to be justified. Gospel obedience is to justify that you are justified. It's, you're justified by faith in Christ alone, that righteousness that covers this section on front and back side that we're all looking for. You're justified by faith in Christ alone. But what justifies that you have true faith is that it begins to change you. And that new law written in your heart is going to begin to spring up and walk in new ways in the paths of righteousness. Perfectly? No way. But changed? What my favorite saying by Newton? I'm not what I should be, I'm not what I could be, and I'm not what I ought to be. But because of Christ, I'm not the same. And that will be the testimony of every child of God. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Gentiles, we don't have the word of God. We're without the law. Yes, but you're not without law altogether. And that's back to that verse 14 and 15. They do have something. What is this? It's it's the law in the heart. It's not Jeremiah 31 where he says, I'm going to take your heart of stone and give you a new one and write my law in your heart. That's not what Paul's talking about here. This is what's called natural law. It's what we call maybe common grace. We're, We're image bearers of God and we receive his common mercies and blessings. The, the, it's the moral norms of the law written on the heart of unbelievers. We are made in the image of God and we have stamped within our constitution his moral goodness, fiber. The, they are uh, embedded in your consciences. So don't steal. Don't lie. Don't murder. Don't cheat. Don't dishonor your parents. You, you, can't, you know right from wrong. Societies are built upon these principles We we see everyday parents who are not Christians just caring for their children. Charities receive money and funds from people who don't know Christ. For the most part, they obey authorities. They return a a lost wallet. Who does that? They help old ladies with their groceries. There's a car on the side of the road like mine last week on the way to church when it broke down. I feel so much less stressed my car didn't break down this morning, but on the, on the side of the road and someone pulls over to help you. No one pulled over to help me. My wife had to come get me. Thank you, baby. Guys, there's a standard of morality within. There's a law within in our natural constitution that is consistent with the moral law of God. And you see it in every civilized society when they make laws and how they govern that they're all very, very similar. And again, in verse 32 of chapter one, they know the ordinance of God and those who practice such things are worthy of death. So even Gentiles have a law and it's not as clear as the fullness of scriptures for sure, but they know basic right and wrong. So what takes place in their conscience and their thoughts, Paul says, it it bears witness and their thoughts accuse them. Isn't that amazing how much guilt unbelievers live with? This is the reason. There's a little courtroom in the conscience of mankind and it accuses you or defends you. And the conscience blows the whistle all the time. 15 yard penalty. 
There's a faculty within us that knows right and wrong from God, from creation. And we wrestle. We wrestle with the light that we possess. C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, he gave the example that it's there and say you're on a bus and there's one place and, and you beat the other person to that seat and you don't argue whether it was right or wrong. You, you say why it was right for you to do it because there's just both of you knew what you did is wrong and you're trying to vindicate or justify it. So what is Paul's point? Gentiles are judged by the light that they have, not the Mosaic law. But the moral compass inside of them, they have creation telling them there's a God and they got a moral standard within them that they know and it accuses them and even tells them that's not right. And then they just keep sinning and doing it. Jews are accountable. Law, Gentiles are accountable because they all fall short of the glory of God and what they know to be true. And he just keeps saying, you're not obeying it. You're not keeping it. So you're condemned. You got to obey the law perfectly. And there's just no one who can do it. So you're under condemnation. Paul just wants to come now and put the nail in the coffin to finish everyone off. Everyone who's a religious hypocrite. That's what chapter two is about. You judge everyone. And and I've got believers just shining the light on their hearts, just sick over their sin and wanting to change and grow. And, And that just shows you're not in Romans two. This is for the hard hypocrite. I just external. There's nothing internal. I still look to my own hands to get myself right with God. I'm just a phony baloney. <clears throat> Everyone who comes short of the glory of God. Every human being who's been born in the seed of Adam. I want you to hear verse 16. On the day, the judgment day he's talking about. So the the judgment day, this eschatological judgment that's coming for all men. Where listen to this. He says, according to my gospel. I want you to hear this. This this is the gospel. This is the gospel that there's a judgment day. And there's a way to be delivered through that judgment day. And, And this is gospel, guys. God will judge the secrets of men. Everything secret, here's that word, will be revealed on the last day. The private courtroom of conscience that he just talked about with the Gentile, that only you and God knew, is going to be public on that day. And this is powerful. He knows every secret of your heart. One of your favorite songs. And I'm going to put the gospel on it like that song. He knows your thoughts. And he knows the motives of your heart. He even knows why you do what you do. He's perfect omniscience and he knows the deeds of your life. And in verse 16, it's going to be brought to life. Psalmist 139. O oh Lord, thou hast searched me and known me, thou It does know when I sit down and when I rise up. Thou dost understand my thought from afar. Thou dost scrutinize my path and my lying down, and you're intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there's a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, thou dost know it all. Thou hast enclosed me behind and before and laid thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful to me. It's too high. I can't attain to it. It's going to be laid before you. And I think of the best descriptions of the religious Pharisee is self-justifying. I did this because you did that. It's self-deceiving and it's blame shifting. It's all over Romans 2. It's all over society. God's pointing his finger at you this morning. You who are still in Romans 2. You have his word and you have his law and his creation, and maybe you teach it, and you tell other people how to live it, and you judge everyone in this world. But you have never held it up to your own heart. And the bottom line in this chapter, I want you to hear this. You can't keep the law of God to be right with him. 
We're all suppressing his truth and disobeying it when we're born into this world. No matter what we say, it's what we do. And you think your rescue is your privilege. I've been raised in a Christian home. I'm a Baptist. My dad's the pastor. I was baptized at age five. You condemn the world, Romans 1. But the bottom line, a day of judgment is coming. And the secrets of your heart will be open and laid bare before God. And he will judge you in a perfect knowledge that is retentive. He forgets nothing. And it'll show that you didn't have a love for God. You just liked learning doctrine. You're conservative, so you liked its teachings. I had people who used to tell me, I came to Southside because I I liked that you guys were conservative and strict. (laughs) I like moral teachings. I'd love to tell other people how to live. It just feels good. Where they're wrong. It just made me feel like somebody. You just love putting on the mask every Sunday. I love it. I get to go to church and put on my mask and everybody's going to applaud me and just say, you're a godly man. I love that. I love it. Just living the life of a full hypocrite. Making sure you use your right words with the right people, whatever context you're in. You're just a little chameleon and you fit in anywhere you go. You love hanging out with unbelievers. You love them and you call it evangelism. But it's your unity. You just get along with them because they love the same trash that you love. You sleep with your boyfriends and girlfriends and there's just no shame. You condemn homosexuality. All your lies, you're just a big liar and deceiver. That's all it is. On that last day, your mask is going to be taken off. You're going to stand naked before God. And the secrets of men, the secrets will be judged for you and God. And you will not have a Savior on that day. And your little fig leaf isn't going to cover anything. It's just going to be thrown off. Jonathan Edwards said, first to those who live in secret wickedness, the the true Romans two man or woman or child. Let such consider for all these things, God will bring them into judgment. The secrecy is your temptation. Promising yourself this. You indulge many sins and practice many lusts in the cover of darkness and in the secret corners, which you would be ashamed to do in the light of the sun and before the world. This temptation of secrecy is entirely groundless because all your secret abominations are known even now perfectly to God. Secrecy is a big lie. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be closed and all the world might become accountable to God. Even the secrets of my heart and my motives and my intents and my actions, what I do and don't do, all of it is open and laid bare before God and it's all un righteous because by the works of the law then no flesh will be justified in his sight for through the law comes the knowledge of sin so i want you to stare at who you are before god suppressing all of his revelation and i don't want you to look at the law and try to clean your dirty face on the mirror the law is a mirror this morning showing you what you are before god and what you need now is your your body washed and cleansed by the blood of jesus And so I pray, don't run to law. Don't run to trying to clean yourself up. Don't try to go to the law and start trying to keep it better. There is no hope. You need to be cornered and you need to die this morning to any hope of anything else but Christ. Creation tells you there's a God and you've rejected him. Put him out of your mind and thoughts. You don't give him glory and thanks. The wrath is revealed. God gives you over. You're just drowning in your sin. And if you're not saved from this death spiral that you're in this morning, 
It's going to end in this wrath that Paul's talking about on Judgment Day. And those who have the special revelation, the law of God, can't do it. It can only judge you. You Judge others while you keep doing the same. It isn't going to get you through judgment. It's going to bring a greater condemnation because you knew God's will and you would not do it. All of your boasting and your religious and knowing the Bible and all of that is just more light and revelation that you're suppressing and rejecting by your unrighteousness. And on that day, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men. There's no way out. Your mask and your secrecy will be made known before the judge the judge of the secrets. And I want to close out with one last phrase in verse 16. This is the only reason I'm still standing this morning. God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. In John 5, for not even the father judges anyone, but he's given all judgment to the son. In Acts 17, Paul said, therefore, having overlooked the time of ignorance, God's now declaring to men that all everywhere should repent because he's fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, Jesus, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. The judge on the last day that all will come to is God incarnate. It's the man, Christ Jesus, the one who, who Paul said he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The judge is Lord and Savior and judge According to my gospel, <laughs> Hokema, the commentator, said, It is most appropriate that Jesus should be the judge at the final judgment. He's the one who became incarnate. He died and he rose again for the salvation of his people. And those who believe on him are saved through him. It is most fitting then that he should be their judge. And it's so appropriate that he should be the judge of those who rejected him. They've rejected him this morning, and then you continue to reject him. And oh, the one you are rejecting on that last day will be your judge. It's just an exclamation point to the whole thing. All of your rejection, the one you're rejecting is now the judge who will send you to eternal life or to eternal death. Just his last final exaltation of all. The completion of his kingdom and absolute victory. So what do you do with his revelations? His revelation of how to get true righteousness. A righteousness that can get through the judgment of God. The judge of the secrets of men, he sees and knows all. And the law cannot save you from that day. It can only lead you to Christ for the righteousness that you need to have to get through his judgment. And my stomach just gets sick of how people will feel when they stand before this all-piercing and all-knowing judge whom they rejected. With the law, or with the Bible in their right hand, clothed in unrighteousness. Our land's just filled with it. Are we filled with it? Getting through this day with just privilege, or just law, trying to keep it and violating it daily, is the most foolish thing that you could ever do. And that is just, on a daily basis, that's what's happening in our country. They they truly believe the way to get through this day is to be religious and moral and good. And I pray that Romans is just killing you if you're in that state. That you have no hope this morning of climbing out in your own works and your own strength. 
But for us, believer, and Jesus Christ, I want you to hear this this morning. I'm not ashamed of this gospel because it's the power of God to save you from that day. To save you from the wrath of God with the secrets of my heart open. You'll come before that throne. And if you can, you're going to look up. And you're going to all of a sudden see the judge. He's my friend. He's the friend of sinners. The law tutored me to Christ. I, I stand in Him complete. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. That's my favorite title. You shall name Him Jesus, for He will save His people from their sins. <laughs> You're going to stand before this judge who loved you and gave Himself for you on a cross. Your sins were paid for. And you are wrapped in a righteous garment of His own. The righteousness of God, of Christ, is revealed from faith to faith. And the, the law drove you to this Christ. And what a day when He says, well done, good and faithful servant. And you throw your crown at His feet because we didn't merit eternal life. We just lived as those who received it freely. <laughs> it took my heart and my life away. We walked in the good works that he prepared before the foundation of the world. It's just going to all be to him and to his glory and his grace. Thank you, Jesus. And he's going to say, enter into the joy of your master for all of eternity. So can I tell you this child of God, your judgment day will be your best day as you enter into paradise because of Jesus Christ alone. You'll be forever with him. Do you see what is laid up for those who love Christ and are looking for his appearing? One of my favorite authors, as you well know, is John Newton. I want to close with just a little, little ditty that he wrote. See the judge, our nature wearing, clothed in humanity, clothed in majesty divine, holy God, holy man. You who long for his appearing, then shall say, this God is mine. Gracious Savior, own me in that day as thine. And my gospel says thine you are by the work of Jesus Christ and own you, he will. <laughs> the only place to flee from Romans 1, 2, and 3 is to flee to Christ for refuge. Safe in Christ and in Christ alone. I would hate my own soul if I found it not loving Jesus Christ. Isn't he lovely? So I close out, unbeliever, Someone in Romans 1 or 2, there's just no way out. You're going to stand before the God who knows the secrets of your heart since you were born to the day you die. You can't bring in these smooth-talking lawyers and let them talk your way out and have a jury that you trick. It's going to be before a God who knows. Would you flee to Christ to be saved from the wrath that is to come on that last day? And for the believer, the diagnosis of Romans 2.5 was a stubborn and unrepentant heart. And the capstone on both sides is that we pursued unrighteousness. And you couldn't fulfill the law's demands. And so you got a stubborn and unrepentant heart. And you, you can't fulfill the law's demands. And the Bible gives one answer for your problem. It's Jesus. Jesus fixes both. He goes up on a cross 
And he, he dies in your place what you deserved. And it melts your heart. It circumcises it, he's going to say in a couple verses in chapter 2. You're going to get a circumcised heart that now that flesh is taken off and you're sensitive to God and you love him and you want to live for him and please him and make his name known. That's, that's what happens. And then he clothes you in the perfect righteousness of his own son by faith. And then he says, if you love me with hands with holes in it, keep my commandments. Oh, I love the new covenant. If you love me because I have made you right with God by my doings, keep my commandments. To a Christ who will judge the secrets. And if you've been lulled to sleep by the society that we live in and by a lukewarm church, I've just been praying for revival with all of my heart, 2020 revival. And God hits us with a pandemic and we get quarantined. And he calls home Greg and Jeannie. And we get hit with viruses and our economy is breaking and we're losing jobs. And we're in isolation. The way you punish people in prison is you put them in isolation. And it's, it starts messing with you, doesn't it? I'm getting weird. <laughs> and then God throws me into Romans 2. Whose stupid idea was it to start back up in Romans 2? And it's, it's been a boomerang section. And what it's done for me is, I'm going to get through that judgment day. Because of Christ and Christ alone. And I love him and I, I want glory and honor and immortality and good things. I want that more than I've ever wanted it. Not to be accepted, but because I am accepted. That's what I want to pursue over this stupid world that's passing away. This Christ is worthy of more love and worship and adoration an obedience of faith and a labor in his commission because my judge is my savior. Hallelujah. And I want to go to the table now and remember the only thing that really truly matters is, but now God has made another way for us to be righteous apart from the law and the works. And so let's remember together the glory and the beauty of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I thank you for the pain and hurt of Romans 2 that just is honest and shines and reveals, but it leads us to a sweet, sweet Savior. God, I pray for any unbelievers still hard, still looking and judging everybody. Lord, I just pray that you would melt that uncircumcised, hard, rebellious heart by your kindness. You've sent a way out of this predicament. And it was at the cost of your own son, piercing him through for our transgressions. Oh God, for a lamb that came and obeyed your law and you said, this is my son and who I'm well pleased. Oh God, that is offered to everyone this morning to be able to hear this is my son or daughter and who I am well pleased because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Not one stitch of our own garment will ever make that up. God, I pray, let us all look to that and believe. And rejoice that this judge is our Savior. And because of this beautiful work that Christ has done in our hearts and lives, Lord, we have good works that we will walk in them by grace through faith. And God, it will always be all praise to you. It'll never be anything that we did. Our, our goal isn't to work harder so judgment day will look better. Our only hope is Jesus Christ. God, that is our only merit. And I thank you for him. And I thank you that that sweetness changes lives and does mighty, powerful, wonderful things. May you keep working in every one of us, I pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.